Frank Heider is a well-known, renowned visual artist. When he started to become an artist, he thought the journey would be a straightforward progression. Over the years, he has discovered that the road has many twists and turns, numerous hills and valleys, and countless challenges. Through this series of short stories, tales, and remembrances, his hope is that these will offer some valuable insight into the life of an artist and what's involved in becoming an artist. In the end, he has come to realize that he is not a painter, or sculptor, or anything in particular. He is more simply a creative person, with great passion and love for the process of making art concerning people and the world around us, who shares his artworks with the public. Join us now as we listen to another episode of A Life in Art series. When I first came to Philadelphia, uh, after graduate school and after living in New York for a couple of years, I came down to Philadelphia basically for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons was that um, uh, my friends in New York were all buying these huge, beautiful studios in in Chelsea, in uh, Soho. And in those days, you could get 2,500 square feet for two th for twenty thousand dollars, and you would own it, and uh, that was great. The problem was I did not have twenty thousand dollars. I, uh, my wife and I had been living in in Manhattan and working, and we had saved eh, more or less about ten thousand bucks, and so uh, I realized, you know, I didn't have enough money to buy what I really wanted to buy. And, uh, you know, my, my parents lived in New Jersey and I, I couldn't imagine living in New Jersey, but I had some friends in Philadelphia from Yale who were painting and they were in these cool buildings in, uh, what's called old city. And, uh, they seemed to be affordable. And so I said, well, maybe I can do this in Philadelphia and I'll be a little closer if my parents can need some help. My father wasn't well, so I said, maybe I can at least be close by. So anyway, I had come down to Philadelphia to visit uh, these guys, and uh, I went for a walk, and I wandered around Old City, and I, I asked about prices on buildings and, uh, you know, spaces. And At first, what I was thinking of was renting, and uh, the prices were way, way cheaper than New York. And, uh, and I kept walking around and I saw a sign on a building and I ended up, uh, you know, going around to this realtor's office and he showed me this building. Um, and I said, uh, well, uh, how much does it cost to rent this building? Now, this was a whole building, an 18th century big house which had big rooms. And he said, well, $100 a month. And I said, for the whole place? He said, yeah, well, isn't, isn't that a fair enough price? I said, yeah, it's real fair. Uh, and then he said, but if you had any money, you ought to think about buying it. And I said, well, how much would it cost to buy? So he said, um, well, the owner wants $9,500. And I didn't, I'm 25 years old. I didn't know anything about buying anything. And I, I said, well, would he take 8000 he says, I don't know. Let's call him up and find out. So he calls him on the phone. And uh, 15 minutes later, I signed a paper. I bought the building for $8,750. And uh, I, I, I walked out the door holding this piece of paper. And I got went back to New York to tell my wife. I said, look, I, I just think I bought us a building. Um, I think we're going to move to Philadelphia. So which what happened we did we moved down there and the building was in terrible shape and it was freezing cold and had every kind of problem you could imagine but i i had the building and i i figured i could fix it so i was working on that and at the same time with my friends a couple of my friends that i had come down there to visit with uh we realized that there was you know not so many great opportunities to show your work so there was a new federal courthouse building that had just been built at Sixth and Arch, and uh, there was a uh, a new law that uh, allowed federal buildings to be used as art galleries, uh, and so we 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 sat around and we came up with this idea: let's organize a show. 
So we put together a show in mind and then we began to kind of work on it so we met every week with a group of artists and then we began to solicit get people to send us images and we began to curate and build the show now we really didn't know much about it but we were pooling our thoughts and our experiences and working on it so we came up with a plan for the show uh and one of my friends was real, real clever. He went, he got uh, one of the oil refineries to contribute some money so he could make a little catalog. And then uh, uh, we talked to a couple of art galleries that existed, one in Chestnut Hill and one that existed down in Old City. And uh, we got them to agree to show drawings by us or uh, smaller paintings. And then in this great big federal courthouse space, we were going to show really large paintings. So anyway, um, this we worked on this, this show for, it took us months to sort of put it all together. And we had some really terrific artists that we had put together, put in the show. And the time came to put the show up and we hooked put the work up and then we planned for a big reception we went to the reception and basically nobody was there it was just like another day for, you know us and a few of our friends and that was it so we we just accepted that for what it was and then that was on a friday night and on monday morning the judges came into the building and they saw the paintings hanging in the building and they had nude figures in them, and the judges ordered that the paintings be removed. Now, to make it even funnier, the head judge's name was Judge Lord. He was the chief justice of the court, the federal court in Philadelphia. So uh, when they called us and told us we had to come and take the paintings down, one of the artists had a husband that was an attorney and she called her husband and he said, no, 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 that's not going to happen. So he, he made a couple of calls. And the next thing you know, there was a, a lot of commotion and the newspaper people came down. And uh, so we had this big discussion with the management of the building and people from the federal court house arguing and, one thing led to another, and uh, the newspaper came out with a headline. The Philadelphia uh, Daily News had the headline that said, uh, um, The Lord Says No Nudes. And it was making a joke out of the, the Chief Justice's name, which was Judge Lord. And it says, uh, The Lord Says No Nudes. No Nudes. And they showed a picture of somebody carrying a painting with a nude figure in it. So we negotiated through this with this attorney's help, and we, we got an agreement where the building had a kind of an invisible line that ran through the middle of it, where part of the building was owned by the General Services Administration of the federal government. The other part belonged to the federal courthouse. So anyway, we moved all the nudes from the federal courthouse port portion and put them in the, the federal uh, services part and hung reverse the painting so everything was fine but there was so much news coverage every day we were on television every newspaper every day that week we were on the front page of the newspaper for five days in a row and we were on the radio we were on the tv news and so thousands of people now were coming every day to see the show and then the a critic from the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote an article about the show and how good the work was and how small-minded the, the judges were, et cetera. And it turned out that that show got more publicity than almost any show in the history of the city of Philadelphia had ever gotten. And uh, out of all of that, uh, an art gallery uh, sprang up on Walnut Street that was run by a guy by the name of Chuck Moore, and Chuck Moore was very, very knowledgeable about painting. And uh, he was the organizer of what was then called the Butcher and Moore Gallery. Uh, the Butcher Singer family was a very famous uh, Philadelphia family. And Noelle Butcher was a member of that family. And so she was Chuck's partner. So Chuck built a gallery using some of those artists from that show. 
and immediately got a lot of attention from the press and the art critics because it was the work that was forbidden to be seen downtown. So it was kind of a real positive thing and began for me a career of showing on Walnut Street in Philadelphia and having uh, an audience. Well, working with that uh, and uh, in that role as an artist and working with Chuck Moore, eventually... I had a gallery in New York that was willing to give me a show in Soho in a pretty nice space. And uh, uh, Chuck Moore was very helpful in getting my work uh, up there and helped me do the catalog and all the rest. And then uh, my show was up in New York and it, it was really went really well. I sold a lot of work and I had a lot of interest. And uh, uh, so... I, I figured, well, I'm on my way now. I've got some something really cooking. And I went back to my studio and proceeded to paint with the plan that I would have in another 10, 12 months. I'd have another body of paintings that I could show in New York. And then the gallery suddenly in New York closed and Chuck was able to go up there and get my paintings out before the padlocks were put on the door. And uh, he got my paintings and... Uh, uh, I said, now what do I do? I've been making painting for a show and now I don't have a gallery. So Chuck comes back to me and he says, look, uh, there's a space that we can rent if you want to. Uh, and we can have, it's a really great space. We can have the show. So I knew that having a show was great, but you had, a show has to have a, pur a purpose to it too. So I wrote 125 letters to art galleries in New York City all personal letters, inviting them to come and see my show because now I was looking for a gallery. And I sent those 125 letters out. We had the opening of the show and the show was really, was really, really well attended. And I had five, five paintings uh, that were on either sold or about to be sold. So it looked like a real success. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that was on a Friday and the following week, on a Tuesday of 1987, the stock market crashed, the biggest crash since 1929. And uh, the sales that I had made on Friday suddenly didn't exist anymore. And uh, everything looked pretty grim. Um, anyway, uh, got, got through the show uh, got to the end of the show, managed to sell enough paintings to cover my cost. And uh, anyway, there was an old sculptor who came in to see my show, whose name was uh, Peter Agostini. And he was an abstract expressionist sculptor. And he walked out of my show and went down the street and saw a dealer whose name was Anita Shapolsky and went in and he said, Anita, there's a real good artist down the street who doesn't have a gallery. You ought to go down. You can pick him up. He's, he's available. Well, Anita didn't do that. She wrote me a letter and invited me to bring my slides to her gallery for a show uh, that she was curating. So I had a date with her and I also, from all of my 125 letters that I wrote, I had four other appointments that I had made for that Saturday. So I came into New York in the morning and I got there early and I was ahead of all of my appointments. So I wandered into O.K. Harris Gallery and I, O.K. Harris had Ivan Karp, who was a legendary uh, curator. Uh, well, he was the manager for Leo Castelli and he was the discoverer of Rauschenberg and Motherwell and all kinds of great painters and uh, I walked into his gallery and he was standing there and I I said uh, Ivan uh, he said yes and I said I hear you look at artists work and he said yeah I do and I said would you mind taking a look at my slides and he said sure I'll look at him so he holds them up to the air and as he looks at him he come brings him down and he says well you're better than most of the people I see and he holds them up again and he says but man you're out there and he said you're really not for me and uh, I said, well, I'm told that you know Soho so well that if the gallery, if the artist isn't right for you, you know the gallery where the artist belongs. So he looks at me and he said, look, kid. He said, I told you you're better than most of the people I see. He said, there's 150 galleries here in this neighborhood. And somebody right now is sitting in that gallery 
waiting for you, but I'll be damned if I know which one it is. So I kind of scooped up my slides and I went out and I went down the street and I went to where I was supposed to be going to Anita Chapolsky's gallery. And I went in and the gallery director said, uh, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm here to see Anita. I have an appointment. And she said, well, Anita has not arrived yet. And she said, you just sit right over there. I know who you are. You just wait for her. She'll be along soon. So I sat there. I waited half an hour. She still hadn't shown up. And I noticed that two women had gathered in the foyer of the gallery space. And they hadn't gone up in the building. They hadn't gone into the gallery. They were just standing in the foyer. And I could just see them in, through a little piece of the window that went into that foyer area. And then they just stayed there and nothing was happening. And then I noticed this woman coming down the street and she was so, uh, such a showy, the way she was dressed, she looked like she was wearing a, uh, like almost like a, a, a Spanish bullfighter's outfit or something. She had this, this kind of bolero hat and this cape, this red cape. And I said, I bet that's Anita. And, and as the woman turned and go up the steps of the gallery, she steps into the foyer and with that, these two people who had been waiting in the foyer tried to get her to look at their slides. And shes I see her out there struggling. She's got her ha hand in the air with her cape, and she's hollering at these women to leave her alone to get away from her. And she opens the door to come into her gallery and slams it shut behind her. And as she says, I have too many artists already. I don't need any more artists as she turned around and sees me sitting there. And she says, and who are you and what the hell are you doing here? And her assistant said, Anita, he has an appointment with you. And she says, he has an appointment with me? She said, yes. And, she, and I said, yes, and you're late. And she said, uh, well, okay, what is it about? And I said, you asked me to bring some slides. And I said, and I did, but I don't have time right now because I have another appointment and I have to go back to my car and get my painting to go to show to somebody else. So she said, you came to my gallery with an appointment with me and you didn't bring a painting? I said, ma'am, you asked me to bring you slides. I have the slides. You are late. I have another appointment. I have to go. She said, will you come back? I said, will you be here? She says, of course I'll be here. I said, well, you weren't here when you were supposed to be. She said, look, I'll be here, but you come back and you bring those paintings with you. So I said, all right, I'll be back. So when I came back from another unsuccessful appointment, I walked in. She said, now you put those two paintings right there on the floor. I want to look at them. So she stares at my paintings. And she's now give me your slides. So I give her my slides. She holds them up and she says, I want this one and this one for the show that I'm doing in Pennsylvania. And I said, okay. And she said, and you leave those two paintings right there. And I said, no, what for? She says, I'm, I'm hanging a show next week and I'm going to put those two paintings in the show. And I said, oh, okay. So I got the information. I, I left. And I came back the following week for the opening of the show and she said hello to me again and we spoke briefly and I looked at the show and I was happy to be in the show and when the month passed and the show was over, I came back to the gallery. She says, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came to pick up my work. The show's over. She said, well, I want to hold on to it. I said, well, Anita, I already told you I'm looking for a gallery. I, I'm not just looking to have paintings on somebody's shelf. She said, look, I told you I'm interested in you. And she said, in fact, I'm going to buy this painting right now. And she said, and, and I, and she said, and I'm going to give you a show. I said, well, when is the show? She said, it'll be in October. And I said, and you're going to buy this painting right now? She said, yep. So I said, okay, well, she wrote me a check right then and there. I scooped up my check and I walked out the door and I went on to have the show with her in October, just as promised. And you're, Two years later, after two more shows, I was with her in her place in Jim Thorpe. She's sitting by the lake. She's in her bathing suit. And she turns to me. She says, do you know why you're in my gallery? And I said, no, why am I in your gallery? She said, you're the only artist who ever came in the door who didn't want to be in my gallery. And she said, I had to have you in my gallery because I couldn't stand somebody not wanting me to be their art dealer. 
And she says, that's why you're in my gallery. So using that as a, as a story to illuminate how shows sometimes can produce interesting results. You can sometimes find your, your way by trying to do something you have no clue about. And uh, I, I'll never forget either one of those experiences, organizing that first show in Philadelphia and all the press that came with it and working with Anita and doing my shows with Anita. And out of that show to this day, there is a five-star hotel in Geneva, Switzerland, where Anita sold them two giant eight-foot square paintings that are still on display in this five-star hotel with a, with a, a plaque next to them. And uh, all of that would never have happened had I not been able to sort of... Uh, pretend that I really wasn't interested in talking to her because I saw that she really wasn't looking for artists. She was had something else on her mind that day. And the last thing I wanted to do was to get in the way of what she was about to do. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or suggestions for future episodes, please reach out to Frank Heider on Facebook or Instagram. We hope to see you at one of the next A Life in Art episodes.